watching and listening to Conscious Evolution Media. Shifting global consciousness at ConsciousEvolutionMedia.com. Today's podcast is brought to you by Kids Talk Foundation, a global nonprofit organization providing youth advocacy, television programming, and training services in the United States, along with comprehensive medical and educational services for the developing world. Most recently in Kenya, Africa, where Kids Talk Foundation provides a feeding program, medical care, and educational services to over 1,300 young people each day. Please help our youth and place your donation. Go to www.kidstalk.org. Are you in the entertainment industry? If you answered yes and you want to promote yourself, your passion, and profession, check out Creative Independent Artist Magazine at ciaartists.com. Endorsed by Kids Talk Foundation Worldwide. Welcome to Unopened Gifts, the weekly one-hour program dedicated to understanding the human potential that lies within us and the abundant life that lies before us. Inspired by the personal journey of our host, James McPartland. Well, let me tell you, they don't come much more inspired than me on this lovely Thursday afternoon in Orange County, California. It's about 11 minutes past the hour of 2 o'clock here on the Unopened Gifts program. For those of you who have returned for a uh, special show today, I thank you very much. For those of you who are here for the first time, I will repeat to all groups that the purpose of this program, Unopened Gifts, is to inspire you, the listener and the viewer, by virtue of the stories of the great guests that come on to do something unique and special in your own life, to open the gifts, as I like to say, that all of us possess. Today's show will not disappoint. It will certainly inspire. I do have my good friend, the Irishman from Asia, Patrick Shen, on the program. He is a founder, filmmaker, if I'm not mistaken, Patrick, it's Transcendental Media. Uh, there are there are a number of films to his credit, along with some great life lessons, and I am familiar with a few. I did have to make some notes here. Films include Fight from Death, The Philosopher Kings, and La Source. And Patrick was kind enough to share a lot about the life journey, the things he's learned along the way, and what's gone into making the films that may not show up on the screen as much as it shows up in the man today on the program. So, Patrick, welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Well, listen, it's an honor to have you. You know, as uh, we got to know each other a little bit, I, as I said to you and as I said to the folks that are kind enough to give us their time by tuning in, one of the great ways, I think, to um, inspire people or light torches or give people a chance to do something unique in their life is by learning some life lessons from those that have learned their own lessons along the way. You, my friend, have learned a few lessons. And, uh, you know, we were spoke recently about that um, few-year journey in and out of uh, Haiti. Uh, the work you were doing around the um, area of water and need that we all have. But tell us a little bit, what's the Patrick Shen story? How did you land on this version of Success Mountain today? Yeah, well, my uh, my first love was music. Um, and uh, that goes way back to, I think, when I was 12, when I first picked up an instrument. And uh, <clears throat> somewhere in the middle of high school, maybe my junior year, is when I kind of uh, had my first introduction to film, the medium of film. And uh, I had taken a, a video production class um, in order to learn how to make a music video for my band at the time. And it was just, you know, it was love at first sight. It really was. It was, uh, you know, like two puzzle pieces sort of coming together. And uh, it was very much like I had discovered my voice for the first time. And I, and I had found the vehicle through which I would, you know, communicate to the world and share stories. And you know, it was really um, about my own sort of discovery as well. Um, and so, you know, long story short, I, 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 I um, you know, did some production assistant jobs and grip work early on and ended up getting a job at E! Entertainment Television eventually and uh, did some teleprompting work and some audio work there as well. And in about 2000, I decided to take the, take the leap and pursue filmmaking full time. And uh, yeah, the, the rest is history, I guess. <laughs> And the history, which when you put in a book, is going to be a colorful read for all of us. And you were kind enough to share, and some things we talked about is, you know, I, I will put it in my own words is, you know, what you get in life is important, but what you become is far more important because what you become, nobody can take away from you. And we talked a little bit about the most recent body of work and how I would say the um, chisel was out sculpting your soul 
uh, as you were uh, going down this path. Can you talk a little bit about how you ended up in this foreign land and, and what transpired to have you embark on this film, which I don't think was planned early on. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, I had done a documentary previous to La Source, which is called The Philosopher Kings, as you mentioned earlier. And that film was about the uh, experience and the wisdom of janitors, uh, specifically janitors that work at universities uh, in the United States. And so we followed around eight different janitors for that project. And one of those eight uh, was a name. Uh, it was a man named Josué Lajeunesse, and he's a janitor at Princeton University by day, and at night he drives a cab, and he literally works about 20 hours a day, um, and does the whole thing, you know, over and over again, almost just about seven days a week. Has five kids that he cares for in New Jersey, and so we got to know the man as uh, through the process of making the Philosopher Kings, and we come to find out that he's had this lifelong dream to bring clean water to his village in Haiti. And, uh, you know, ever since he was a kid, literally, um, you know, uh, hiking up this, this mountain, two-mile hike up the mountain to fetch water for his family, often twice a day, he's always dreamt of, of resolving this somehow for his people. And so we touch upon that a little bit in the film, The Philosopher Kings. We started screening the film around the country, and, it, you know, eventually it was broadcast on television as well. And people just kind of started freaking out about him. Um, and there was this sort of outpouring of support and this groundswell of support that just kind of happened seemingly overnight. People would literally come up to me after screenings of the film and hand me money uh, that they wanted to get to Joe Sui. Um, you know, before we knew what he had raised, you know, in conjunction with some of the efforts that Joe Sui had underway and other people within his community had underway as well, about $40,000 for this water project in Haiti. And so we decided, being filmmakers, you know, let's at least have the cameras on and document this, um, and we'll kind of see where it goes. Uh, so what started out to be just a simple, you know, humanitarian endeavor to help our friend Joe Sui out became a film three years later. Wow. And, and, you know, you were kind enough to share, and I think this is probably helpful as we embark on the story of, of, of your journey. and. Well, I like to say to people that tune in, you know, that it's often uh, looked at for individuals who come on a program like ours and say, wow, look at this individual is. He's got his own film and production company. He's traveling the world. He's doing documentaries. This guy's figured out the formula. And while there's some aspect of that that's certainly true, uh, what I think you were, you, have sh you were kind enough to share with me, if I would say, uh, you know, you, you've learned a heck of a lot or you continue to, which is one of the great hallmarks of life. I think the more you find out the more you recognize that there is to find out in the game but you, you talked about this particular the trials and tribulations uh, of this this these last few years and I'm sure there's been some lessons that you didn't anticipate uh, and probably more to come you touch a little bit on sort of the, the hardships that you've endured yeah absolutely I mean I, yeah like you said I have I have a little way to go still and I'm still constantly learning and uh, if there is a formula out there for for this business um, you know, I, I've not been uh, I've not been exposed to it. Um, I wish I had some sort of formula. It's been it's been tricky. All the films that I've done up to this point have had some degree of, of hardship. Um, you know, if there wasn't that degree of hardship, of course, the rewards um, wouldn't be tough. Um, partly because of funding, um, it started off very very rough because the project was happening, whether we were ready to produce a film about it or not. Um, we certainly w weren't going to, um, you know, slow the fundraising campaign down for the water project. We that was first and foremost uh, what we wanted to make happen here, and so we just kind of started putting a crew together and flying out to Haiti with not a single dime in our pocket to go towards the expenses of this film. And you know, filmmaking doesn't pay to begin with, and so it's not like I have a huge padding in my bank account to sort of finance these kinds of trips. Uh, and so initially that was hard, and like I said, early on we had no idea we were even making a film. It was just sort of this ex this journey that we were on. We wanted to help our friend, and you know the way that we sort of interpret the world and and, and express ourselves is just through filmmaking. And so we just happened to to bring our cameras along and document this. And so, you know, uh, one trip turned into two, three, four, and then seven, eight trips, I believe it was, to Princeton University to document Joe Sui's story you know, in New Jersey. 
and all this is mostly out of pocket. Along the way, we had thro thrown some fundraisers and whatnot. Um, but yeah, long story short, um, and no surprise, I guess the, the the financing part of this was hard. And what was mostly what was most challenging about this whole thing was, um, you know, how far do we go to in, in telling the story before um, you know everything sort of starts falling apart at home. You know what I mean? Uh, and I have I have two kids now, very young kids, and my wife doesn't work, and so I'm kind of the sole breadwinner at home. And there's a lot, uh, you know, you know, there's a lot of people that depend on me to to provide. And so, you know, at, at many many points along the way, we had very serious decisions to make um, in regards to whether or not we needed to continue, whether or not we could continue, whether or not we had the resources to continue. You know, and ultimately, obviously, we decided the story was worth it. Um, people needed to hear the story. We we realized that if we had stopped, the world would go on not knowing about this wonderful man, Josue Lajeunesse, and the incredible things he did for 5,000 people in La Source, Haiti. Um, and just no one would know about the story. Um, and we thought that would be, that was just too tragic. Um, mm -hmm. And we thought the sacrifices and the blood, sweat, and tears that we put into the filmmaking would ultimately pay off somehow. Um, a lot of faith goes into making films as, as, as it does with a lot of other occupations, I'm sure. But this one especially, you spend so many years of your life on a particular project and you have no idea how it will be received. You know, um, Most films do very poorly in the box office. Most films don't even get made. Um, most films don't recoup even their initial you know, budget and so it's a very risky business to be in, and to to invest three years of your life and your heart into something, um, only to have it potentially rejected by the public um, or, or those you're making the film for, is you know it's, it's a devastating uh, potentiality, you know. Yeah. You know, there's great symbolism that as you, as you share the the stories and, and the trials and tribulations, you know, for. Folks that tune into the program, heck for myself, my colleagues, you know, we we have dreams, we have goals, we have, have ambitions, and you know, once we start heading out into the world with it, they we often are confronted with resistance uh, and the naysayers and the doubters, uh, much less that little voice that might be inside of our own head. Uh, and I suspect along the way, you probably had a few meetings with yourself. Uh, where you said, all right, what's, what, what's it going to be, particularly if you look in the eyes of children and a spouse who are dependent on you, along with you know, those in your professional world. And for those that are, are tuned in, I'm, I'm sure there's a curiosity, as there is with me, is how did you overcome the voice, the fear? Why are we doing this? We should stop this. We ought to go down another path. You've got responsibilities. You have children. Uh, and, and, and continue to persevere. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you mentioned resistance. Uh, I think it was a book called The, the War of Art, uh, in which the author uh, talks about resistance and all, all the sort of forces and the voices that work against you along the journey. And you know, his prescription to that that problem is simply to, to you know he's a writer, and so he puts it within the context of writing. But he he says you just have to continue writing. You know, there's no magic formula. Um, but it's, it's sort of the day-to-day -day grind is what you have to be prepared for. The day-to-day -day grind is what you have to be committed to. Um, even when there's seemingly no light at the end of the tunnel, you have to find that belief in yourself that what you're doing is important and worthy, and then simply take one step after another. Um, there's, a, there's a quote that I use in one of my previous films, The Philosopher Kings, which goes, uh, what, what saves a man is to take a step and then another step. And I think it really, at least for me, it's come down to that quite a bit. It's just, you know, once I get inside my head a little bit too much is when I start getting discouraged and when things kind of start, um, you know, getting a little bit overwhelming. But it's when I focus all my energies on the very next step and then to take another step. It's kind of the only way that I can find to get through and to to complete the journey. Uh, great, um, great wisdom in the words of just... Uh, Keep pushing forward. I guess the only way out yeah. is, is through. Yeah, uh, and yeah. you know, and the biggest battle is the biggest the, is the film that we create in our own head. Yeah, right? as, as filmmaking goes, the story we tell ourselves, which is often disempowering and can slow us down. And uh, and curious too about the 
you know, the film industry has, you know, from the outside looking in, there are names and there are stars and those that win the awards and all that stuff. I suspect there are folks that um, maybe they're known, maybe they're not known, that you've uh, aspired to have aspects of your career unfold similarly, or maybe there are mentor moments or people that you look up to that have been a bit of a guiding light, whether you know them personally or not. Are, are there people you admire more than maybe some others that you, you could share some learnings from? Yeah, um, you know, I, I certainly have heroes um, in the filmmaking world. Ang Lee is one of my favorite filmmakers. Alejandro Gonzalez in Yuritu, who did Babel, the posters right there. Uh, another one of my heroes. Um, you know, I, I, to be honest, I haven't studied up on on their careers and sort of their path to success a whole lot. Uh, I know a little bit about Ang Lee's Lee's past. Um, I know he sacrificed a lot. His wife also sacrificed a lot so that he could spend time to complete a couple of his initial screenplays, which he um, later on, uh, you know, directed and produced, and, you know, the rest is history for him. But, yeah, you know, I, I think uh, I, I think the, the common denominator for all of these successful film filmmakers has been just a lot of, you know, it's simple, but I think profound in its simplicity. It's just a lot of hard work, and it's a lot of commitment. Um, there's so many people in this business that, that give up, you know, a few years in, uh, even five, ten years in, and it often just, you know, I, I think people, um, I think people find success eventually when they simply do not give up on something and they feel, and they stay committed to something. I think it's it's impossible not to succeed in some level. Well, you know, you used the word I think grind, and one of the interesting things I I have experienced and continue to experience is there are those. Those moments, it's almost like the word balance. When people ask me about balance, uh, I have a background in health and wellness and some executive development and leadership. And I say to folks that, from my perspective, balance is a bit like surfing. Uh, you know, you're, you're out there somewhere training to get ready to surf. You uh, look at the, you're on the beach, you're looking out for the sets to come in. You probably put some wax on the board, you get your wetsuit on, you're in the water. The actual time that you're physically on top of a board for most of us is pretty small. That momentary points of balance, the other time it's a grind, it's treading water, it's doing the things you've got to do, and I think that's a great point around the lessons of just you, you grind in, grind out. You'll have your moments on when you pop up on top of that surfboard or your names in lights, uh, but those are the infrequent moments uh, that perhaps put a little more fuel into the tank, uh, if you will. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and I guess I guess the equivalent for me, uh, the filmmaking world is uh, well. There's probably several equivalents, but one of them for sure is when the when the the product is done, you know, and you get a chance to share it with audiences, um, and you get those responses that you kind of oh, you, you wish that you'd get um, throughout the filmmaking process, you know, and it's you get people in tears coming up to, coming up to you after you're finished, just your film just finished screening and. It's like those moments are are, are definitely, um, you know, why I stay in this business, for sure. Yeah. And let me ask you now, because I do think that the hallmark of what you've described is the, you know, the, the persistence, the perseverance, probably knowing where you want to go and probably constantly reminding yourself and killing that little voice or the, kill the monster when it's little, when it tries to talk you out of it, right? Get out of your head, as you would say. Yeah. Is, you know, from the unexperienced perspective, now there are so many ways seemingly that someone hangs out a shingle and they're in the film business or they're in the media business or they're publishing a book, right? It's the dynamics seem to have changed and, and everybody's a, a star on their own film and have the technology around them to, to support it. Doesn't necessarily mean they're an artist, what have you. But is the the crowded nature of the space complicating things at all or is that helping you separate yourself, if you will? Yeah, you know, it's, it sounds weird, but a little bit of both, you know. Um, there's a lot more crap out there um, because it's so cheap to make a film, um, and it's definitely sort of muddied and flooded the, the marketplace. Um, having said that, you know, story will always be king, and uh, people in the industry, uh, the acquisitions folks and whatnot, they know that, you know. Uh, they, know how to, they, they know how to tell a good story. Um, or, or rather, they, they know a good story from a bad one, you know. Um, and so, despite there being a lot more product in the marketplace, um, you know, there's still very few people who know how to tell a good story. Uh, so a little bit of both, oddly enough. Yeah. All right. 
and, to, and another thing, another thing too, with, with sort of this digital revolution that's happened in filmmaking uh, and how it's become so easily accessible to so many people, there's still very few people doing things in this business. Um, you know, I would say just based on my interactions with other people in this business, 90% of people who 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 pretend to be in the business are not doing anything. There's a there's like an epidemic of inaction in this business. I feel like you know, and it's when you find yourself just completing something uh, in this business and all other fields. I'm sure it's very very similar. You you, you build you build you start building momentum. People take notice, um, mm -hmm. and the simple act of completing something uh, I found often leads to, you know, uh, some level of success. Well, if, if you don't mind, there's some questions coming rolling in from the various channels who are tuned into us today, and I do have one from a, uh, I would assume, a young woman by the name of Tina who's very interested in getting into the film business, but is spooked by the fact that she's never done a do this and looking for some advice. Would you would you go down the path, or would you suggest someone find a new gift that they have and, and go in a different direction? I would definitely suggest going down the path, if, especially if it's something that um, that uh, you know, if it's if it's a similar situation with her as it was with me, where I found something that that became my vehicle to speak to the world, um, then she she owes it to herself to follow that path, you know. Um, as far as, as as far as how to get into it, that's that's a um, that's a complicated that's a complicated question, of course. But I think ultimately you have to find your voice within this field of work, um, and I think developing and finding your voice is the biggest challenge of any artist, and that just requires going out there and doing it. You know that that requires going out there and shooting as much as possible, making as many films as possible. As we said earlier, it's so accessible these days. You can literally go out and buy a camera for I don't know a few hundred bucks and start making you know pretty good-looking movies. Um, it's easily done. You know, you don't need a whole crew. You don't need a lot of gear. You can literally go out tomorrow and start shooting a movie. So I would suggest her doing that if it's in fact something that she feels passionate about. And she does as much as possible and find your unique voice uh, and, and learn how to tell a story. Uh, so if uh, that I take from you is 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 carry on, right? You follow your voice, follow your heart. You know, there's someone else here who wants to take advantage of your wisdom. A young chap by the name of Adam who asks, if you had the chance to, how would you have advised yourself ten years ago? <laughs> because, because if you go back, knowing what you know now, and coach you ten years ago, what would you what would you say to yourself? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, huh? You know, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things I would probably tell myself. Um, you know, I made a lot of mistakes along the way, uh, just in terms of how uh, the, the people that I the, the people that I partnered with on the projects uh, that I've done. Uh, I've made a lot of mistakes there, and so just in regards to that alone, I guess while we're talking about that. Um, um, you know, just make sure you're on the same page with people. You know, if you're going to be if you're going to be spending three years of your life on a project, and that's very realistic in this business, it's often very it's it's often longer than that. Um, quick story: I did a panel recently on, with a bunch of other documentary filmmakers, and we all went down the line and talked about how long it took to do our most recent projects. And it was like nine years, five years, and it got down to me, and it was three years. And the audience was like you know, ooing and eyeing like this was some, you know, magnificent accomplishment that I was able to do in uh, three years. Um, but yeah, you're going to spend a lot of time with these people that, that you're working with over the span of these three, four or five years. Um, make sure that, that you're getting into a relationship that, that's going to last. Um, make sure that you're not only uh, creatively on the same page, but it's someone that you can hang out with. I found that uh, that's kind of a good rule of thumb for me as far as who I get into business with these days. It's like if I can't hang out with a guy, if I can't go, if I don't feel good about going to grab a beer with a the guy, then then we might have some issues. Um, and so I would say, yeah, make sure that the team that you're putting together is solid. You know, as far as financing is concerned, I would probably tell myself to uh, lay off my own credit cards and, and stop using my own money, um, which I made the mistake of early on uh, and paid for it really just in terms of a lot of debt that I had to pay off for, for years. Um, 
but yeah, you know, those are a few things that, that come to mind, but there are a lot of things. It's a great question. Uh, you know, it's interesting as I, as I hear you describe that, uh, Patrick, and maybe there's similarities in many of our journeys as you and I spoke the other day. So I have just br finished and brought a book across the finish line. The book is called On Open Gifts. Uh, j just went to print. You're not taking calls, are you? Nope, just, sorry. <laughs> it's all right. I'm not calling you. Uh, so it, it just came across the finish line to print, and it's been a, a, a three-year um, trudge match. And all along that continuum, you really, you know, you talk about the people you surround yourself with. And because I was new to the game of being an author, publishing, etc., don't didn't know the players, didn't know who to believe, who not to believe. The kaleidoscope of the industry was changing in such that Amazon was raising its head and they were playing games. The big houses looked like they're consolidating, how people were consuming content. And, of course, you ask anybody's opinion and you get plenty of them, right, in terms of what you do, should do. And I made some choices with some folks that I believed in uh, with no history behind it and found somewhere down the road that I think I made the wrong choices. And the um, painful decision was that I was vested, I was on a path, it had taken so long to get there to change horses or make a decision to shift was hard, even though it was comp I felt like I was compromising my own integrity. That was the lodestar for me. So the point being is maybe these individuals could have done things and I could have got there a little bit faster, but it wouldn't have been someone to go have a beer with uh, <laughs> or, or nor leave my uh, wallet on the table with. Uh, and all along the way, probably like yourself, and I would encourage those that are considering the things that they want to do in their life, the tests will continue to pop up. I, I call it like that game of the carnival, whack-a-mole, where those little moles just keep coming mm -hmm. up, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, that's life, and those little buggers keep popping. No matter how many times you hit them, there's an obstacle, an obstacle, and it's like an obstacle course. And it tests your commitment. It, ter it tests your, you know, your perseverance. It'll test your bank balance. Uh, it tests relationships. Uh, and so it's, I guess, really makes me think, as you described that, is to be as clear as one can be about what you're trying to get to and or accomplish. Any road can almost get you there unless you're really clear on the road you want to go down. So... I would, um, I'd love to have a meeting with myself 10 or 15 years ago. I'd straighten myself <laughs> out pretty quick. For sure. <laughs> well, wouldn't we all, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so what's next? What do you got cooking? I am, uh, I've got a couple of projects uh, in the works. I'm uh, doing some scripted work. I'm working on a script uh, that I hope uh, will go into production in a couple of years. We'll see where that takes me. Um, but I've got another develop. Um, feature documentary that I'm developing as well, which I hope will go into production uh, by April of this year. Uh, that project I'm calling uh, In Pursuit of Silence at this point, just a working title, and that's going to be about the importance of silence in our lives, the beauty of silence, um, the value of silence, and the damaging health effects of noise pollution in our world. So wow. just kind of get started about with, with that one. Yeah. So let me welcome some folks who have joined and remind folks that this is the Unopened Gifts program. The gift I have today to share with you comes in the form of a gentleman by the name of Patrick Shen. Patrick is a f documentary filmmaker. I'm sure there's some other films to his credit. A successful film producer. A man who's learned a lot of things along the way, being kind enough to share those gifts with us today. Has his own film and production company called Transcendental, if I'm not mistaken, right? Films? Yep, yep. Transcendental Media. Media, excuse me. Yep. And... I would think I would know what Transcendental comes from, but tell us what was the genesis and why that choice and what does it mean to you? <clears throat> yeah, um, you know, I think uh, life, life is, uh, becomes overwhelming for a lot of people. Um, and I think we have a tendency to sort of put the blinders on, you know. Um, Kierkegaard, I think, called them uh, immediate men. You know, you're just sort of about the immediate things before you. Um, because otherwise, when you open up those blinders, it just kind of gets too big and too scared, and it becomes very difficult to navigate. Um, but I think there's a danger in that. And so my thinking behind calling the company Transcendental Media is to sort of allow those who experience our films to kind of transcend the everyday and sort of step out of that shell a little bit and kind of re-experience the, the, the world outside of their immediate. Um, so that's the thinking behind Transcendental. You know, the, the word transcendental, I think, goes back to the 1800s, uh, I believe. There's a, a, tra a movement called Transcendentalism, Emerson, well, um, uh, you know, yeah, all the great thinkers of the 1800s. I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now, embarrassingly so. Um, <laughs> but anyway, <yeah. laughs> 
That's right. Those guys are service. Heck, they might call into the program. Uh, <laughs> say, thank right. you for got us. So, so hey, listen, I, I got a question from our good friend Tony, who's on the East Coast somewhere, keeping warm in that cold weather. And this has to do with how you look after yourself, meaning you have lots of obligations and responsibilities on the professional side, expectations of family members, and you've got to keep some alkaline in your own batteries. What do you do to keep yourself sharp and take care of yourself? Wow, that's uh, I don't do very well at that to be honest. Um, I I work takes up a lot of my energies. The kids take up a lot of my energy, and be between those two things, I honestly don't have a lot of time to myself. And that's definitely an issue that I'm looking at closely these days, because I feel like it's taking its toll a lot more uh, than it used to. But yeah, I wish I had some <laughs> I wish I had some wisdom there for <laughs> for your viewers. But yeah, I'm trying to figure that one out myself. Um, yeah. You know the the work is rewarding. The work the the, the work feeds me spiritually, uh, creatively. Um, as a human, it's it's something that I have to do, and so I get a lot of nutrients from that. But um, but yeah, I could use I could use a lot of a lot more sort of silence and calm in my life for sure these days. You know, Tony, yeah. depending. On I said, depending on our guest's question, there might be an opportunity for him to engage you in some particular coaching. That might have been a loaded question. Um, <laughs> this, this gentleman may know you, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, all right. Well, you, let me ask you this about, you know, to, to go down the path as you've gone down, and you mentioned there are some folks that have inspired you or, or and the folks that you admire in terms of their work. Along the way, maybe even when times were, were challenging, have there been resources that you've tapped into, whether they're books that you know speak to you that you go back to, or a particular genre, and or you know elements of someone's film or or, or their support people? You know, is there a nucleus of sort of uh, energy, if you will, that you can tap into that that's helped you along the path? Yeah, I would say so. Um... You know, it's it's there are a few things there. You mentioned books, and I, I mentioned War of Art earlier. I think the author's name is uh, I want to say Stephen Pressfield, but I, I might be getting that wrong. But the War of Art is a is a fantastic book book about just sort of the grind, the grind of being an artist, and how to get through that, and how to counteract and 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 uh, meet resistance. Um, but you know, for me, you know, it's simple. It comes down to watching movies. W movies is what got me into this business to begin with and it continues to be sort of my source of inspiration uh, I call the theater my church you know I go there to to, to see the world to meet the world um, and to to you know uh, expand my my perspective on the world um, so yeah for me it's very simple I just I need to go to the movies as, as much as possible but surprisingly you know with 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 my schedule I I don't I don't get out much uh, to see movies but uh, Perhaps that's the missing, the missing uh, piece here for me. Well, you know, it's interesting. For a number of years, I was uh, heavily involved in the health and fitness industry and uh, had a manufacturing business supplying exercise equipment around the world. Uh, I have a personal passion t to maintain that, but I found that most of the folks involved in the business on a global perspective didn't have time to exercise. Mm. <laughs> And yet, it was their right. profession, right? <laughs> right. Uh, and so, it's not unusual uh, that we, um, uh, even in areas where we specialize, we don't necessarily get a chance to um, uh, take advantage of, from the other side of the screen, if you will, uh, right. Or, right. Or the other side, of, or the other side of the treadmill, uh, or get to shut <laughs> off the back of the treadmill, if you will. Uh, all right. So, how about yeah, there's there's a question here from Diana. I guess this is a testing of your. Uh, your crystal ball skills. Oh and, boy! And this has a little to do is, is when you look into the future of your business. Did, what do you see evolving and changing? I guess it's in terms of either how people consume media, produce media, engage in media, interactive media. I mean, what's the crystal ball looking like? Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I think that audiences uh, are becoming more sophisticated, um, and they're tired of of fluff. Um, and I think people just in general are seeking more authenticity in their lives, and I think they demand that as well in, in the movies that they, they watch. Um, and so I think that we're amidst uh, kind of a, a movement in, in art and film specifically 
where we're kind of getting back to real stories about real people. Uh, Silver Linings Playbook is a good example of that. Um, this happened um, in the 50s, actually. In the 50s, you had a very similar kind of thing going on where, you know, you had these, these uh, movies that didn't really mean anything. You know, they were entertaining and they were fun to watch. Um, you would have, for example, women waking up out of bed with makeup on in movies. Those are pretty, you, you often see them. <laughs> And then the 60s came around, and, and, and the United States uh, specifically was just in a lot of turmoil, and people kind of, they needed, they needed some real stories. They needed some real human stories. Uh, folks like Coppola came along and did that, did that very thing. Hollywood wasn't interested at the time, and so Coppola packed his bags, took his, his family of filmmakers up to San Francisco and started his own little production company and made films their way. Um, uh, you know, uh, and about the things that they wanted to, to be to, for it to be about, and Hollywood eventually came knocking because the films were so powerful um, and they were so telling. And so I think we're we're kind of amidst uh, another movement kind of like that, where where audiences they want real experiences again, um, and that I'm I'm pretty hopeful about because that's that's kind of what I do, you know. So it's a it's a good time I hope anyway for for me to make the kind of movies that I make. Um, you know, there's a lot changing too on the fundraising front, where crowdfunding, you have your Kickstarter, Indiegogo, those kind of websites that are largely responsible for a lot of film projects getting launched these days. I think I read recently that 10% of uh, films that premiered at Sundance this past year were all funded um, through Kickstarter. There's a wow. there's a big documentary that's out right now, Ai Weiwei, about the Chinese dissident uh, artist um, that was shortlisted for an Oscar, but I don't believe it got the nomination today. But that was funded through Kickstarter. Uh, so it's a lot. The middlemen, the gatekeepers, are getting cut out of the equation. So now it's more about the artist and the, the consumer, the artist and the fan base. Um, there's direct inter inter interaction, um, not just about the art, but just in, also in terms of the financing. So we now have the opportunity to finance the projects that we want to see in the world. And I think that's that's a really exciting, uh, exciting development going on. It's not just left to the handful of gatekeepers at the, the big studios to decide anymore. You know, in, in light of the, the funding and maybe those that are thinking about raising funds to, to, to pursue this passion themselves, is there a, um, uh, if you, for lack of a better phrase, a model where someone invests and they say, well, if I invest in a film, I'm sure there's a lot of personal passion around that, probably some hobby interest as they are in many categories, but nonetheless, from a pure business perspective, are there economic formulas that people say, you know, if I have for every one dollar, I expect X in return over some period of time, is it, or is it unique to, the, you know, the, the type of film? Yeah, I think it's very unique to the type of film. Um, you know, these days with independent film, uh, you know, a lot, a lot is riding on the sort of target, the base audience of that particular film. And then your ability to sort of mobilize that core audience uh, that hope that that you then hope will spread to a wider audience. Um, you know, you'll, for example, the the La Source film. Uh, it's about a Haitian janitor, and we reached out to a lot of sort of Haitian groups within the United States, a lot of NGOs and and nonprofit groups within the United States, to try and kind of mobilize them and create this sort of core audience and core fan base. And if you can mobilize them effectively. Um, then, then you're doing all right. There's a there's a filmmaker by the name of Robert Greenwald, who made a film. He makes a lot of these political sort of activist type of documentaries. He did a film about Walmart a few years ago, and another one about the about the Af uh, war in Afghanistan. And uh, for one of those films, I can't remember the title now. He had worked with MoveOn.org to help promote w this film, and they have such a huge membership that um, you know he sold. You know, I think he sold uh, a few hundred thousand copies of his DVD just through that that email blast alone. And so, if you're able to sort of identify that core audience and mobilize them effectively, then there's a lot of be a lot of money to be made in this business, um, for sure. Yeah, but not one formula, unfortunately. And for those that are curious to know more about MoveOn.org, anything else they ought to know, or anything you can expand on that? MoveOn.org. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know too much about them. They're a political organization. Um, I think mostly sort of online based. Um, but 
yeah, you'll you'll often find them supporting one political cause over another or a particular policy, and they're very very effective, very powerful in in this country. And you know, a question now has come in around some things you've been touching on, but it's the influence of social media, how it's incorporated or how it's used to uh, promote or expand the awareness of what you're doing. What, what's the influence on social media with your business? Yeah, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of interaction between artists and fan now, and the middleman has largely been cut out or is at least on his way out. Um, and most of that interaction takes place online, um, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or you know email, um, and that has that has, that has allowed this movement to happen. Really, social media it's uh, it's at the core of this movement. Really, um, so yeah, that's a huge part of uh, all my strategies moving forward as a filmmaker, as far as how to market our films and how to continue getting financing for our films. It's an often overlooked thing, I think, for filmmakers. Um, partly because I think they're so busy making films and there's just not enough hours in the day for this kind of stuff, but it's it's huge. It's huge. It's It'll be key to many filmmakers' survival, I think, in these coming years. And, and for example, you, in your generosity of giving us time today, we, we hope, obviously, to create some awareness of what you're doing, but now spending time doing this type of program and or others is it has it become an important part of your strategy to be with in the media, so to speak, to create the awareness of what you're doing or promote your own brand? And do you spend much time doing this kind of work, if you will? Uh, you know, from time to time, yeah, um, it goes in phases. You know, because right now we're in sort of the release phase of uh, my current filmless source. Um, I have to do a lot of this kind of stuff. I'm happy to do it, and, and it's vital to, to what I want to continue doing and vital to, to my line of work, for sure. Um, you know, with, with this sort of new revolution that's happening, this interaction between artist and fan, um, uh, you rely a lot on social media. You rely on lot, a lot of uh, sort of uh, these type of programs and, uh, in order to get the word out. And so... Um, you know, the LA Times, even though we did get a nice write-up from the LA Times, they're only writing up a handful of films every year, and so you can't rely on, on sort of the mass media to promote your film. You have to really get out there and find programs like this. You have to, you know, be very active on social media, any possible way to kind of get the word out, um, you know, on a grassroots level is very important to filmmakers, yeah. Well, there may be a fan here that knows you or is generally curious, or this is a loaded question, but the question for you, Patrick, is what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, <laughs> I, want to be, I want to be a filmmaker. I want to be a filmmaker. I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm proud to and, say. Yeah. And does the, the, the type of film evolve over time as you see it? Um, you know, I... I the, the, my company's motto is to agitate the sleep of mankind. I don't, I don't foresee that ever being any different for me as time goes on. I think the projects will get bigger uh, and 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 better uh, as I get better and learn more in this business. Um, maybe more epic in nature in some cases. Um, one of my ultimate dreams is to to make a film called Socrates. You know about the life and trials of Socrates, um, and I know that I just won't be. I'm not so wise enough uh, and rich enough to do a project like that, and I probably won't be for decades and decades. Um, so someday, maybe I'll be doing films of that scale. Um, but yeah, as far as the type of film, no. This is this is. I feel like this is what I should be doing. Well, I think there's another friend here that uh, is curious about you, or maybe they have their own designs on their career. So the question here is, who will play you in the feature film version of the Patrick Shen story? <laughs> the most boring story ever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, God, I, uh, that's a good question. Um, I know Socrates is not available. <laughs> <laughs> How about Don Cheadle? Would that work? <laughs> Listen, uh, he's, he is quite effective. Uh, <laughs> And, um, you know, I guess you won't have to worry about being harassed in public if he, film, <laughs> if he stars as you, right? No one will right. mistake you to. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, how about, you know, folks who have uh, tuned in with us today or maybe they're barreling down the road sometime later this week and listening to us 
uh, through their sound system. What is it uh, that people can do to get a hold of you, learn more about you, guide us to uh, a film clip, guide us to a website? How can we learn more? Sure, yeah. I, I guess the best place would be transcendentalmedia.com. Uh, that's my company's website. Um, all our films are, are, are on there and trailers as well. So that might be the best place, yeah. And if, if someone were interested in having someone do film work for you, does somebody reach out to you or do you point them in someone a different direction? If someone says, boy, I'd love somebody to film this aspect of this story of this particular individual, is it the kind of work you do? Uh, yeah, I think I think if the story is right, for sure. Um, I typically... Um, I typically find my own stories, but yeah, if a story comes along and it's powerful and it fits within, you know, who I am and, and, and what I do as a filmmaker, for sure, there's a contact page on the transcendentalmedia.com website where people can get in touch with me. That's probably the best way. All right. So, uh, th if, so there, there's the answer. If somebody wanted to track you down, you go through the website, and there's a, a link to get to you or an email address for you or an info at? Exactly. Yeah. Just Press contact, and it'll take you a little contact page, and you can fill out all your information there and click submit. Yeah. And, and if anybody wanted to learn more about Joe Say or the film that you did around Haiti and or provide funding uh, or support that, is that also available through your website? Is it another place people could go? Uh, the best place for that would be lasourcemovie.com, L-A-S-O-U-R-C-E movie.com. And you can see the trailers and a bunch of campaign videos as well. Uh, and you can read up on uh, the sort of action campaign that we've launched alongside the film to raise more awareness uh, for water projects and whatnot in Haiti. All right, so uh, uh, consider this question, Patrick. So you now are a master of the universe on this program. And for those that are tuned in live with us today, whether they're watching or listening, coming from whether source they are coming from, or as I say, maybe they've downloaded us and we're uh, with them somewhere into the future here, you know, as I say, many folks who are kind enough to give us their time by tuning into Unopened Gifts are looking for that spark as to, you know, what is it I can do this year? You know, January is a great time for that to advance the ball, if you will, on writing that book or creating a film or starting a relationship or starting a business or losing weight, whatever the important initiative is. And willpower can only take us so far. So, you know, given the life lessons that have come to you, thus far for those that are out there sort of listening in with a respectful approach of wow if he can maybe I can are there a couple things you'd leave us with to say you know if you're pursuing something these few things have served me here would be my you know my considered opinion on what might help what would yeah, you leave yeah. Us? yeah you know I talked earlier about how there's this epidemic of inaction in the film business but I think it goes for a lot of different uh, fields um, I think that's the greatest thing. That's the greatest thing that I've learned. So the greatest lesson that I've learned is that um, is is the power of completing something. It not only gives you more fuel to continue going. It not only um, uh, feeds into your belief in yourself um, because you, you you've seen that you can actually do it, and you 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 get to hold this sort of tangible item. So so many of these projects that we that we we dream up are so abstract in nature and they, they stay abstract for so long while we're working on them and trying to make them a reality and we lose hope very quickly uh, because it's just it's, it's, it's this intangible thing right um, but I think that moment when you when you complete something whether it's a five minute short film whether it's a short story whatever it might be um, the feeling of completion I think uh, helps drive this entire process and, and drive the momentum and give us that hope and um, and, and, and the fuel that we need to, to keep going. So I would say get out there and, and stop waiting and, keep, and just start doing as much as possible. Start doing as much as possible. That's how we'll learn. That's how we'll find our voices when, in whatever field of work that, that we find ourselves in. Um, finding that original voice is, I think, key. Just keep pushing forward. Yeah, just keep pushing forward. But, you know, and, and I think it's important to, to continue researching and reading the books, and, and the schooling is all very important. Um, but... Uh, but I think a lot of us, a lot of us, kind of postpone that moment when we're going to start. Um, we postpone our sort of happiness and and the rewards that we get from from the process of doing. Um, but a lot of times it doesn't. It's it's very simple to start doing. You know, if it's writing a book, you could look. It, you don't need anything to start writing a book. Um, you don't need much to start making a film, um, and you don't need much to finish any of these things either. You know, um, but I think we we. Fall feel like we're 
we're not ready or we're not equipped to do it. Um, and we, maybe we don't have enough confidence in ourselves, but I think the doing gives us all of those things. Nice. Well, great wisdom. Uh, and there's nothing like experience. Sometimes it's, it's learned by doing. Uh, and you know, a lot of times you change the tires on the race car as you're going down the road. You just got to keep going. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it does test your, your perseverance commitment. And so you have, in fact, given us the hallmark of this program, gifts. I'm talking about your with humility, your, your, your life and your journey and your, and your lessons and your fitness routine, uh, which is Black a lot of that part, <laughs> that, 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 that 2014 goal. But, it, but what's important about it is, is, is this not coming out of a book, this is coming out of life experience. And what you've given people is that encouragement to, to carry forward, that those obstacles will show up. One of the best ways to, to get the life lessons is to get the life lessons. Uh, and we kidded each other the other day, and I talked about how some of the setbacks I've had proved to be the best thing that ever happened to me. And when someone had told me at the time that that would be what happened, I wanted to hit the guy on the nose. Uh, and now I look back and say it was the setbacks that helped me open some gifts. And you know what I see in you and hear in you is a, uh, a fountain of um, presence and of gifts to come yeah. forward. And, and touching people with your, your films has got to be rewarding, as you say, to, to inspire some people and light some torches. So thank you for the gifts today. I appreciate that. Uh, likewise, I, I learned a lot today. Thanks. Oh, it's, it's our pleasure. So I want to thank you. I thank those folks that have come in from all different sorts of channels and vehicles to be with us today on the Unopened Gifts program. We intend every week at about five minutes past the hour of two o'clock to bring you the inspiration and the enthusiasm and the knowledge to go forward and do something special in your life. Patrick Shen of Transcendental Media has certainly lit the torch for me today, and I'm sure he has for you. So. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next Thursday, 2.05 p.m. on Unopened Gifts. And Patrick Shen, Happy New Year, my friend. Continue success. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thanks, Cheers. man. Bye-bye. Today's podcast is brought to you by ObesityHotline.com, the silent killer, providing support and encouragement in the prevention of this rising epidemic. Featuring the Body by Vi Challenge. Is there a quick answer to the question? Go to www.ObesityHotline.com. You're watching and listening to Conscious Evolution Media, shifting global consciousness at ConsciousEvolutionMedia.com.